Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you I, I haven't met, I'm Tony Chinatis. I'm the director of the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, this event uh, and for us to host this event. Uh, what we'll be talking about today um, are the new Silk Roads and will China's investments enrich the world. Uh, and the, the organizer and moderator for today is Professor Minier, who's a uh, political economist at the Party School for Global Studies. Um, she's also the academic coordinator uh, for the Asian Studies program here at Boston University. Uh, we're fortunate at the center to count uh, men amongst our faculty fellows uh, in whom we've made an investment to try to bring interesting and provocative and constructive ideas uh, to life. And uh, so I'm quite confident uh, that uh, today's uh, session will be one of those. Uh, and so without uh, any further uh, ado, let me introduce Professor Minier, um, who will introduce the panel um, and guide the discussion. Thank you, guys, uh, for coming. Uh, now it looks very nice, but uh, early today I was uh, very disappointed. Uh, and that also um, brings to uh, our, um, uh, the, some of you may come for uh, Professor Deborah Bradigan, uh, a professor from uh, SAIS, John Hopkins University. And uh, she is really a leading specialist on China's uh, outbound investment. And her recent books uh, included uh, The Dragon's Gift, uh, China's Investments in Africa. Um, that has led the discussion, the literature on China's outbound investment. And uh, her new book uh, is uh, uh, on, the, on the China's investment in uh, agriculture uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, so Will Africa Feed China? The book just came out uh, with Oxford last year. Uh, so I was hoping that uh, she will cover some of that. Um, but uh, 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 her plane got uh, delayed, delayed, and delayed. But she did uh, text me uh, before I came here. She, the, t the plane has uh, taken off. So the chance is uh, she will be here for the last uh, duration of the conference. I know you guys may have to leave early. Uh, feel free to do so. But if you can hang around to the end, uh, then Professor Bradigan will be here and uh, will will be happy to talk to you. And if if you have questions, and you know, this will be a good opportunity to uh, to ask. And uh, uh, I um, so this session, the conference is called China's New Silk Roads, um, and uh, I. Uh, will call your attention uh, to a list of uh, conferences on the same uh, uh, subject, uh, but it's called Old and New Silk Roads uh, in, uh, in Asia. So we have four, uh, but this is the, the biggest event. Uh, we have two more to come. Uh, one is on comparative histories along the uh, Silk Roads, and the, the, the last one uh, was uh, on the geography and environmental uh, dimensions of the, the, the new Silk Roads. So keep uh, what, uh, your eyes out for any emails from the Padi Center or the, uh, the BU uh, Center for the Asian Studies newsletters. And if you just uh, didn't receive any of those, you want to find uh, where they will be held and uh, the logistics, you know, just feel free to email me. Um, and uh, before I uh, start to introduce our speakers, uh, I would like, because I tend to forget in the end, so I, I would like to thank our, uh, our uh, speakers, and particularly Professor Kaid, uh, uh, driving uh, in this inclement weather uh, from <laughs> uh, to here and uh, to share his uh, uh, research. And, uh, Professor Julie Klinger. She has uh, lots of obligations and uh, tasks at hand and uh, as, as, uh, contributing to our uh, uh, conference today. Uh, but last, I really want to thank the staff at the Party Center, uh, Cynthia, uh, John, and uh, 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 Teresa, and they are just uh, so efficient. So I shouldn't take uh, credits for the organization they are. And uh, I, I just, uh, 
returned from the International Studies Association conference <laughs> yesterday. So, so it's a uh, um, thanks to them. You know, we have uh, a wonderful setting and things are run, are, are run so smoothly. Um, Tony, you are very lucky. <laughs> um, okay, so let's. Uh, uh, I will start our. Uh, conference uh, by introducing my research uh, on the new Silk Road. Um, but before I do that, um, maybe a brief, very brief introduction of our two speakers um, uh, to in the, not to the, my left, uh, the left, the uh, left, uh, the leftist <laughs> is uh, Professor Julie Klinger. Uh, an assistant professor at the Pardee School of Global Studies, and she specializes in development, environment, security, politics in Latin America and China. She is truly uh, expert in both areas, and that's very rare, very, very rare. So we are very lucky to have her at the school, uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing more uh, from her. Dr. Khalid Said is a professor at, uh, soci in social science and uh, public uh, policies at uh, Worcester Polytech Institute, director of their system dynamics program and director of system dynamics and uh, innovation manage management program. She re he received his PhD from MIT in 1981, and then really taught in many places in New England, but also taught in Australia, Sweden, and Pakistan, uh, and I'm very impressed with, uh, with uh, his expertise. And today, he will bring uh, new, the new methods and new program, and uh, hopefully this will enrich our studies on political economy and development issues. And Professor uh, Bradigan, I just introduced her briefly, but uh, if she comes, then we'll give the floor to her. If she's too late, then, uh, well, at least she will be here. Um, so my, uh, I'll move to my presentation, but I probably need the Jiang. Uh, oh, so I'll just uh, click on. Okay, great. I know I'll need uh, lots of help from them. Um, okay, so um, the China's New Silk Road Initiative. Uh, I uh, approach this uh, from two dimensions. One is uh, how this new initiative uh, tell us about economic development in the region, and uh, with its implementation, how this will affect uh, the development in the region. And the second dimension that I focus on is uh, how this will impact on regional politics or regional integration. And these two areas uh, happen to be my two uh, uh, research areas. Uh, my first book was on the making of Northeast Asia, looking at uh, regional integration, regional politics, regional economic interdependence. And the second book was on uh, diaspora and uh, foreign direct investments in China and India. There I look at uh, 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 economic reform, globalization in China and uh, in India. And uh, my uh, interest in, the, in China's new Silk Road initiative is I believe this perhaps is the third generation of both trends, development and regional politics. Uh, but there are lots of uncertainties, so that's why we are here, and we have a, a lot more dialogues to come in this semester and uh, in, the, in the next few years. So this is a, 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 a not a very good map on China's Silk Roads. Um, it was a, a little bit dated. Uh, but also because the good maps on China's new Silk Roads is just very difficult to, uh, to get. And there is a, a political reason for it. And uh, I uh, spoke to the, the Chinese um, uh, bureaus in charge of the Silk Roads, and they said we cannot do maps. And you know, because it's uh, what do you took a Tai? Where do you put the Taiwan? And where do you put uh, this region, that region? It's just uh, you cannot use maps. And uh, I said, well, I'm 
based in the U.S., I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so I'll still use maps. Uh, uh, but uh, the um, any publication in China, then I shouldn't use maps. Um, so that's uh, I, I think I probably do use some maps. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, this map just to show very rough, you know, what I am talking about, what this uh, uh, initiative is all about. So there are four main things. The first one is uh, uh, the, Silk, uh, the new Silk Road Economic Belt. Uh, and this one uh, was, the, was the first announced uh, by the Chinese in September 2013. And this one uh, should be uh, starting in Xi'an uh, on the map. Uh, in the um, central China, there is an uh, ancient capital, Xi'an. So that's the originating site. And then go, uh, uh, goes western world to the uh, western border in Central Asia, and on the way to Central Asia, uh, Kazakhstan, and to Belarus, and then eventually should go all the way to Europe. So this is a so-called land-based uh, Silk Road uh, proposal. And the second one is a 21st century maritime Silk Road. And this was announced just a month after the first economic belt proposal. And it was announced in Indonesia by the Chinese president. And it started uh, in Fuzhou, which is a coastal city uh, in China uh, 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 along the sea and all the way down to Indonesia, Jakarta, and then Sri Lanka, then uh, all the way to Kenya in Africa. Uh, it, uh, and then the, the, on the map, it was not mentioned, uh, but earlier uh, last year, uh, China announced a very, actually the largest commitment was on the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So if you if you we see if you can find the country China and uh, then the country PAC uh, in, uh, near the border uh, western uh, western south 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 to China, then the corridor would uh, be crossing the two countries, and the corridor commitment is uh, largest sum forty six billions, and I'll show some of the projects uh, in the end. Um, so this, I believe, uh, was uh, part of the Silk Road initiative, uh, uh, and uh, uh, frankly, perhaps one of the, the more important uh, ones at this stage. And lastly, to implement this uh, uh, kind of roads uh, ideas, uh, China proposed uh, these investment uh, schemes uh, and institutions. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, was announced in late 2013, uh, but got uh, um, just uh, uh, launched uh, earlier this year. It was a very quick launch, you know, considering the, the countries involved and the fund involved. It's, you can write a novel on the AIIB, um, so I, I'm not uh, focusing on this here today. And there are other two, uh, the Silk Road Fund uh, 14 billion, uh, Maritime Silk Road fund uh, 20 billion. AIB China committed uh, 100 billion uh, to this fund and uh, together with, uh, with uh, uh, European and Asian countries. Okay, so this is a, a general overview of this. Um, again, I uh, am um, Academia, so I like to, uh, but you guys can totally ignore this. Uh, but I, I, I want to say is uh, the Silk Roads uh, is important from our uh, academic and uh, policy perspective. It's, it has lots of debates, you know, the policy debates on its imp uh, imp implication. So there are, there are three main ones. All of them are kind of uh, negative. Uh, critical. The first one look at as a global competition by China. 
Um, and uh, the second set look at the initiative as a new wave of colonization by China. And this uh, is based on resources extraction that will lead to lots of environmental cost and uh, eventually making the receiving uh, uh, the countries quite uh, dependent on China. So the dependency is uh, highlighted uh, here. The third one look at China's own uh, state uh, capitalists, the banks, the companies who, who are just uh, self-profiting and self-interested. Um, so I leave all the debates uh, in the background uh, for what I do is uh, to offer a more complete complete uh, analysis uh, on the Silk Roads. So I look at the policy making and uh, I start uh, the, my research on the background uh, from 2001 uh, when China joined the WTO and how, what was the Chinese experience in the WTO as a WTO member and also China's experience in regionalism. But the proximate cause was really uh, the TPP. Uh, the, the uh, America's Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership uh, Initiative. So I, um, the focus of my research is on the policy implementation, how the state actors and how the <laughs> grassroots globalizers implement uh, these individual projects, individual funds. Uh, essentially, I'm thinking this uh, perhaps uh, uh, continues uh, rather than 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 uh, than revolutionarily break the East Asian political economy. So, in the East Asian political economy, there was oh. once the so-called flying geese model, uh, uh, starting with Japan to the the the, the latter. Uh, countries and then the production network uh, as the second stage of flying geese uh, in the region. And uh, this uh, China's initiative, uh, I, I, I suspect it will be the third or the modified flying geese that reflect the Chinese own political economy and uh, regional politics. Um, so moving uh, ahead, uh, I'll uh, only focus on two things. One is uh, uh, the policy making, uh, which uh, the findings I have published in an article in Asian Security. So if you guys are interested, you, know, you can uh, find the article easily. Uh, through the library link, um, the Asian Security. It talks about the ideas and the policy uh, making process uh, behind the new Silk Roads. And the policy implementation, this is a big heavyweight research. So I only have done preliminary work, and uh, uh, here I'll do a little bit of uh, reporting. The, uh, this is a, a chart that I uh, put in the article. Uh, so it's uh, looking at the process of uh, the Silk Road policies. It started with a leadership vision in late 2013, and then they built domestic government consensus, and then they were promoted internally uh, and externally, and in the end uh, got implemented in uh, late 2014. Uh, and all the way to 2015, that was uh, my uh, end point. But uh, um, uh, the, the message is when the U.S. paid attention to this strategy or got aware of this initiative was in November 2014, that's when it already was uh, implementing. So how does the Chinese think about the new Silk Roads? Um, so I, I, I uh, uh, searched the archives on, um, uh, on the Chinese uh, uh, journals, uh, magazines, newspapers, and summarized uh, their, 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 their divided into the economic and the political and security discussions. Um, and uh, there are some uh, significant change over the, uh, over the period. So this is uh, uh, the, the chart that, um, that uh, um, my uh, research assistant helped me compile. Uh, so the, the, the 
uh, Chinese investments abroad from 2003 to 2016. So basically, when China announced the Go Global policy, and that's where uh, uh, that, that's uh, the loc destinations that this uh, investment uh, have gone. Uh, so I divide into the OECD and non OECD uh, countries because we often think of Chinese investments like to uh, concentrate in the non-OECD, and non-OECD tend to have a different nature versus the OECD. So that's uh, generally true. Uh, from 2005 onward, uh, China uh, invested more in the non-OECD countries than OECD countries. But the gap really increased a lot from 2008 to 2013, so the five years. And there are a number of explanations. One is a Chinese own stimulus plan, so they needed to expand uh, abroad. Uh, but the second is really the, the OECD investment environment was terrible. And so OECD investment environment in generally are better than the non-OECD countries, but to Chinese investors, they are not uh, as good. So I look at uh, their perform performance. So OECD investments share uh, of um, these uh, troubled or failed uh, Chinese investments in, in the red line are higher than, the, than the, those uh, successful uh, uh, investment shares. Um, and and uh, the, when the gap became smaller in the latter part of the period, uh, then the OECD uh, uh, sites became more attractive. And uh, the OECD as uh, countries, as environment, as uh, investment environment, you can find the change you know, also in all these uh, uh, economists' articles, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. And so the perception or reception to the Chinese investments are really not as, as great. But now it's becoming much better, and a lot, a lot better since 2014. And that is reflected in the rising trend in China's investments in OECD nations. Um, so the, when I uh, now move to the investments in the new Silk Road uh, countries, I only selected uh, the three countries as a representative case. Uh, Pakistan as in the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, Kazakhstan as on the economic belt, and Indonesia as a maritime uh, Silk Road. Uh, so if I uh, divide the, the, the period from 2005 to 2008, that's more conventional market-driven uh, investment flows. The second period would be a lot more like a state-driven, stimulated uh, investment. And then 2014 and 15, that's after the Silk Road's uh, launching. So we, we see that the Pakistan was very low in the first period, but quickly rise and really rise quickly in the second period. And the third period, it's also very significant. And I was surprised that the Kazakhstan, uh, the, the, the second period was very high that I was, I was aware. But the third period, you know, despite the economic belt fanfare, uh, the investment in Kazakhstan actually was uh, really much lower than the other two. So Indonesia, uh, uh, high, high, high all the way. Okay, and I'll end with this last uh, uh, chart. So if we look at the Chinese investments, in general, it's large. It focuses on infrastructure, energy, uh, uh, because the data I use are about these large investments. Um, and the small investments, I haven't really got my hands around. Uh, but even they are in the, in the uh, same large project uh, arena, there are differences of whether these investments are about extracting, uh, extracting uh, to benefit the home economy at the expense of the locality, or more servicing, you know, servicing and building up the local conditions for, for, for other industrial activities. So uh, here, the, the Pakistan was quite surprising. So Pakistan, uh, among the projects invested in Pakistan, 23 are in energy, but all 
the uh, most of them, it almost uh, I, in, in fact all of them are about infrastructural energy, like a power plant, hydropower, tele, uh, 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 coal, which was abundant in Pakistan. So it's more about infrastructural. And uh, 21 uh, is in infrastructure, so telecom um, towers, uh, transportation, uh, real estate, uh, and uh, the manufacturing and other lighter industries, there are three. Uh, Kazakhstan really clear extractive investments, and it's all gas, oil, uh, 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 gas, oil, uh, and there's one infrastructure. And the manufacturing are all heavy manufacturing industries. Indonesia in between, so the energy, you see the extraction, and you also see these uh, hydropower, um, coal, uh, coal power plants. Uh, there are 17 in, in infrastructure, in transportation, real estate, and 12 they are in heavy industry. So I, I, uh, this it will be very preliminary, but I was encouraged that that, that the Pakistan, uh, the newest trend shows a better trend than the earlier uh, uh, sites. Okay, I'll end here. Thanks. Uh, now let, let me turn uh, the the. The computer to my colleague, uh, Julia Klinger. Okay. Yeah, come. Mm. I think it is. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much, Dr. Ye, and thank you to everyone at the Party Center for organizing this forum. China's New Silk Road initiative is critical, it's shaking things up, um, but it is consistent with um, China's overseas initiatives more generally. So um, I'm specialized in the development and environment politics between China and Latin America. Over the past several years, I've been focused primarily on primary commodity extraction in sensitive frontier regions. So this refers to the Amazon and um, the Planalto Central in Latin America, and in China this refers to the Himalayas and the Mongolian steppe. Okay, so when we're talking about um, the New Silk Road and uh, China's investments in Latin America, we're talking about massive initiatives. We're talking about initiatives that impact on one hand, in the case of the New Silk Road, potentially 4.4 billion people, um, and in the case of Latin America, upwards of 700 million people. Um, and I want to be clear that China is a very key actor in what are broader global political economic shifts occurring. It's a key actor and a key driver, certainly one of the most visible. Um, but also, uh, I want to emphasize that these policy initiatives that are emanating from key institutions in eastern China um, need interest um, on the ground um, among stakeholders and um, key individuals and institutions in national and local contexts in recipient countries. So China is key, but this is part of a global phenomenon, and we will return to this theme at the end. So I want to just give you a big picture of the economic aspect of China-Latin America relations. So China is the primary destination for South American exports. Uh, China's banks provide more financing to Latin American and Caribbean governments than the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank combined. Uh, 2015 was the second highest year on record for Chinese finance to Latin America, with loans to the region topping $29 billion, with a B. And this follows on a 70 percent increase between 2013 and 2014. So many of these loans were announced during Premier Li Keqiang's um, 2015 trip to Latin America. And in addition to China's many bilateral loans to Latin America and Caribbean countries, Beijing also recently established uh, approximately $35 billion in investment funds uh, for regional-wide infrastructure and other industrial development projects. So it's unclear as of yet whether these funds are meant to restructure existing loan facilities or whether they are entirely new sources of financing, much remains to be seen. So in other words, the big picture of China and Latin America is getting bigger, but the exact form of this picture remains to be seen. 
Um, so here, and I don't know if you can see from the back, but uh, the photograph here is, uh, it shows soybeans being loaded onto a China-bound ship at the port of Santos uh, in eastern Brazil. So what's interesting here is that um, just like post-2008, investments in infrastructure and energy projects in Latin America are expected to continue despite the economic slowdown. Um, there are some basic trends to um, the relationship between Latin American Caribbean exports and China. Basically, it's this. Um, Latin American countries export primary commodities to China. These primary commodities are soybeans, iron ore, copper, and oil. And Latin American and Caribbean countries import value-added goods from China. So this means furniture, electronics, that sort of thing. Um, but there's another dimension to this. Um, in addition to um, setting things up for a trade deficit, you also have the fact that um, manufactured goods from Latin American countries are displaced in other markets by goods coming from China. So what's interesting here then is you have, um, you have industries in Latin America scrambling in a number of different ways to either compete with exports from China or to somehow hop on that train. Um, and the photograph here, you see Chilean wood traders um, promoting their products at a China International Furniture and Machinery uh, Raw Materials Fair in Guangzhou uh, last year. So the idea is, if it's not possible to beat China's value-added goods, such as furniture, in third-party markets, then at least there must be a way to get Latin American primary commodities uh, involved in the production stream. So you see an effort to diversify away from, or in addition to the big four, the big four being soybeans, iron ore, copper, and oil. Um, but this diversification is taking the form of other primary commodities. All right, so let's look at China's financing to Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, what's interesting here is that, you know, just like the new Silk Road Initiative um, and much like uh, China's investment in Africa, you have a focus on extractive and infrastructure sectors. Uh, from 2005 to present, Chinese policy banks financed 40.3 billion in infrastructure projects. So by this I'm referring to highways, roads, bridges, port facilities, etc. Um, as well as many energy projects with infrastructure components. So energy loans, including China's oil-backed lending to Venezuela through the China-Venezuela Joint Fund, accounted for 70.2 billion of overall Chinese finance in Latin America last year. Now, China's financing to Latin America is a really important source of capital for countries with weaker access to global capital markets for political, economic, or political economic reasons, such as Venezuela and Ecuador. But uh, China's financing from policy banks goes primarily to four countries. These four countries are Argentina, Ecuador, Brazil, and Venezuela. However, Chinese investment and investment projects um, from the state level on down to uh, nominally private sector actors uh, tend toward a diversity of destinations, from Trinidad and Tobago and Cuba to Mexico, Peru, and Jamaica. So although I'm painting a big picture here, I also want to emphasize that the activity is differentiated and nuanced. And in fact, um, one of my recent subjects of study and publication has been how China's engagement with Latin America is increasingly less visible from the national scale. If you want to understand what is going on, you have to look at smaller scale, company-to-company, uh, -company, local governments, um, local organizations, and their engagements between Latin American countries and China in order to get a sense of the full dynamism of what is happening. So that's just to underscore the point that this is not simply something that is unilaterally being imposed on Latin America, but in fact there's a real interest and desire among key stakeholders in Latin America to attract certain forms of investment from China. Um, but all of this is complicated by the fact that um, China's commercial and policy banks do not regularly publish uh, data on their financial activities. 
So putting things together relies on a whole host of efforts, uh, most prominent of which is the, that by the Global Economic Governance Initiative and the Inter-American Dialogue uh, to establish a uh, publicly available database of China's loans and financing to Latin America. Um, and speaking of, this is a chart from a recent publication by Kevin Gallagher and Margaret Myers um, that shows China's finance to Latin American countries from 2005 to 2015. And for those of you in the back who can't quite see it, we're looking at a chart here that um, describes the trend over a 10-year period. You see the most dramatic spike in the middle, um, 2010, and you see the final um, the final spike here, 2015. So what's interesting here is, you know, post-2008, with the global economic downturn after the 2008 financial crisis, you see an increase in investment and spending. Likewise, in 2015, following economic downturns and slowdowns in China and Latin America, you likewise see an increase in investment um, and finance from China to Latin America. All right, um, and then another dimension here I'd like to emphasize are the infrastructure and energy projects. So there's some interesting trends here. Um, in 2013, China's investment in Latin America spiked. Um, China comprised over half of all new or greenfield projects in Latin America and Caribbean for that year. Uh, the largest Chinese uh, greenfield project in the last few years by far is the Nicaragua Canal, which I don't have time to discuss today, but maybe we can go into that in the Q&A. This is larger than all of the other Chinese greenfield projects combined over the last five years. So even though 2014 didn't meet the same record, China's nevertheless accounted for 17 percent of all new greenfield projects in Latin America. Um, more than any other year on record except for 2013. So what's interesting here is um, you see also a formalization and an increasing sophistication of investment vehicles between China and Latin America. So in 2015, uh, two regional funds for industrial infrastructure and investment projects were established. And these are not simply uh, decorative or discursive, uh, that people are actually moving to mobilize these funds. Um, and as evidence, I present a tweet from the Venezuelan embassy in China. So you have a photograph here um, from February 29th of this year. Uh, with the caption is, Venezuelan ministers began their journey in Be Beijing, um, and they got together with the China Latin America Industrial Cooperation and Investment Fund. So there you have it. If it's not on Twitter, it's not real. There's the evidence. All right. Um, but I want to actually return to this question here around which this gathering is organized, and that's the question of whether China's investments will enrich the world. Um, this is, of course, a complex question, um, whether we're talking about the new Silk Road initiatives in Eurasia or if we're talking about China-Latin America relations. We are, of course, referring to immense, complex regions in which China's investment is a key variable, but not the only variable. So whether China's investments will enrich the world really depends on who you ask, because there are so many different stakeholders involved. Uh, for example, if you're an officer in a Ministry of Finance in a Latin American country, the fact that any deal whatsoever is finalized is good news for you. Your world is enriched, um, regardless of what the outcomes might be on the ground or what the ultimate, what the project looks like ultimately. Um, likewise, if you um, are in charge of a shipping line that is poised to take on um, increased volumes of primary commodity exports resulting from these deals, then, of course, your world is also enriched. But I think you can see where this is going, that although China-related projects are certainly not unique, as compared to European and North American counterparts, they are distinct in certain ways, but they are not unique. Um, Chinese trade, investment, and finance are increasingly associated with significant social and environmental conflict, with some of the most controversial projects moving forward in recent years, despite 
international, national, and local opposition. Um, so Latin American commodity exports to China are almost twice as carbon intensive and about three times as water intensive than average economic activity in Latin America and the Caribbean. And many new Chinese investment projects are slated to go through the heart of many internationally recognized, environmentally uh, sensitive, and indigenous territories. So there's a lot going on here. But before I wrap this up, I think we also need to be clear about who we're talking about when we're talking about China and which capital we're referring to when we're talking about Chinese capital and Chinese investment. Um, and this is where the global dimension really comes in. Um, we need to ask, how Chinese are China's investments? Um, particularly in light of the fact that on lending is a principal part of China's policy bank's portfolios. So on lending refers to the practice where an institution borrows funds from another institution and then turns around and lends those funds to its own clients. Um, the China Export and Import Bank in particular receives funds from 23 countries and five international financial institutions. Now it's difficult to find data on the precise volume of um, on lending as part of the China Export and Import Bank's portfolio, but as an example, in 2006, um, Chexum reported that 42% of its overseas projects, of its overseas loans, consisted of on lending. So we're talking about on lending, and we're talking about um, the cosmopolitan character, really, of Chinese capital. Um, who's involved? Who are the stakeholders here? It's quite a few. So. I invite you to squint, but I will also read the names out loud here. So uh, China's policy banks receive capital from Japan, Germany, Israel, the Netherlands, Austria, Spain, France, Portugal, Italy, Sweden, Poland, Australia, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Kuwait, Korea, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Canada, the UK, and Belgium. This is as of March 2016 published by China's Export and Import Bank, and also um, it partners with the World Bank, the Nordic Investment Bank, the Nordic Investment Fund, the European Investment Bank, and the United States Export and Import Bank. So what is the significance of this? I think this is really important to demonstrate the transnational character of the capital emanating from Eastern China. Um, despite diplomatic criticisms or tensions that may result from um, European or US criticisms of Chinese actions with respect to the New Silk Road or its investment in Latin America, it's important to note that there are certain actors in each of these countries who have a very real stake in these loans bearing fruit and receiving a return on investment. Under such an arrangement, China's institutions assume the greater part of the risk in embarking on new extractive ventures overseas from which parties in other parts of the world stand to benefit in terms of access to new streams of primary commodities and the penetration of new export markets. So this is key. This is key. Because although we're talking about China as a key actor and we're talking about um, how these various investment initiatives are transforming global power, are transforming uh, China's regional and global influence, we also need to be clear on the fact that many of these initiatives, regardless of their environmental and social impacts, are great for business. And they're not just great for business, um, businesses in China. They're great for international business. Um, so to return to our final question here, will China's investments enrich the world? I think the answer is yes for some and no for others but that the outcomes are not at all predetermined, that um, the behavior of Chinese firms in Latin America over the past 10 years alone shows an increasing sophistication and sensitivity uh, for environmental and social concerns alongside continuing problems. All of that to say that there's tremendous transformative potential in all of this. And if we're truly interested in doing things better, working with China, which I think we ought to be, uh, then we need to check our assumptions about given winners and losers, and we need to look very closely 
at who the actors actually are in these initiatives. Right, thank you. So now, <laughs> all right, I'll turn the floor over to Professor Saeed. Thank you. I'm not a, an expert on China, but I have been to China many times and have worked with a lot of Chinese colleagues in Chinese universities. Uh, I'm also not an expert on Silk Roads and uh, on Pakistan. Uh, but I grew up there, and I know what the Silk Road is. And uh, it's, a, it's a parable of sorts based on a real, some real routes where silk trade occur, but now we use that more as a metaphor. And I work on creating metaphors, theoretical metaphors that are widely applicable. And uh, I thought this was an interesting metaphor. Mm -hmm. And it also blended well with another metaphor that I'm going to share with you. And that also comes from China. It's called dynastic cycle. So let's move on. Uh, first of all, as I said, Silk Roads is based on silk trade. Initially between China and India, these were two very prosperous nations in the medieval times. And uh, the silk trade created considerable economic impact along those routes. So our expectation is that, if nothing else, this would still create that impact. Uh, now, this type of investment, the infrastructure investment, as my colleagues have also indicate, uh, indicated, is a cornerstone of Chinese foreign assistance program in Pakistan and elsewhere. And uh, there are all kinds of views about how these programs um, can transfer value or how these might affect the two nations. Uh, but I'll take a, a, a tree view rather than, uh, uh, sorry, a, a forest view rather than a tree view and uh, view the, the scenario from a distance to understand where the investment is occurring, what is the structure of the political economies, where this investment is occurring, and where it's taking us. Now, the, as far as the foreign assistance is concerned, uh, there might be other categories, but um, um, I tried to place them in, in these categories. And there is military assistance, and I guess a lot of uh, our US foreign aid is, is falls in that category. Some of the Chinese foreign aid also uh, falls in that category. There is law and order assistance. Uh, we might send out trainers to, to train um, the, in the recipient country people who would, will help with the law and order. There is direct NGO and other group in assistance sometimes, uh, uh, and assistance to an insurgent group who might overthrow an oppressive regime uh, makes sense, and that has also happened uh, under the foreign assistance programs. There is direct investment. There is infrastructure investment. There is investment in social services. So these are the broad categories. There might be some more detail out there that I've not included in my list. <clears throat> now, um, let me. Um, step back a little bit and uh, talk about the field that I work in. This is system dynamics. And system dynamics is a discipline that is, I can, I can freely say, more dismal than economics. Now, Professor Keynes did say, in the long run, we are all dead, so let's not worry about it. <laughs> but system dynamics worry about the long run only. And we worry about the unintended consequences, which are usually bad. So we talk about bad things, and we worry about the long run. Uh, long run is important because, well, even if we are all dead, our children are there. So we worry about the long run, too. And um, most of our theory building, modeling efforts 
are based on uncovering what we do not see. So a lot of the policy paradigms depend on what's visible. If there is poverty, give someone assistance. If there is infrastructure needed, build infrastructure. If someone is hungry, give food. Uh, so that's the, the box on the top on my diagram here, which is the visible system, which invokes most of the common sense policy paradigms. But underneath the visible system is the latent, what I call the latent structure. And that's, that's what we try to uncover. And that latent structure creates a resilience. You build infrastructure, you build a silk road, and the impact is not what you expect it to be. And what is it that is holding it back? Uh, the purpose is not just to make a dismal statement, but to find a way to change that outcome. That's the positive aspect of what we do. Now, uh, I noticed that the infrastructure investment, um, and I have Pakistan in mind because I grew up there, uh, is being implemented in, in the states where the political economies are pretty complex. Um, in general, a political economy in most of these countries might serve exclusive interests and systematically neglect the populace. Markets often favor specific enclaves and penalize small self-employed firms. And firms have low productivity and many free riding and extract extractive actors within the firm. So um, uh, here mentioning the the general characteristics of three levels in the system, the whole political economy, the markets, and the firms. And um, a little bit of detail on the characteristics of the political economy. Uh, again, in, my, in the back of my mind is Pakistan. Uh, a weak economy, deprived, impoverished public, some very rich people too. Uh, very authoritarian government, a lot of corruption. Um, underground economy is there. Uh, there are warlords, dacoits, bandits, and terrorists. Uh, there is uh, violence and, and rebellion and periodic catastrophic changes in regime. The military takes over or, well, there are changes which are not smooth. This is the characteristic of the political economies and in many other countries too. The markets are stagnant. There are struggling peripheral firms. These are small, self-employed people who go to work every day. And to some degree, they, they are the ones who don't get any support or assistance, but they provide the continuity in the economy. Uh, there are monopolistic markets, share leaders who get all the uh, perks and privileges from the government uh, and uh, in fact are very profitable, but entry in that system is very limited. There's deception, book, cooking. Uh, there are many Bernie Madoffs out there. Uh, the firms engaged in smuggling, illegal production, services, fraud, and there is of course litigation. And within the firms, there are workers who are uh, exploited, underpaid. Uh, the uh, shareholders and executives are often overpaid. Substandard production, uh, workers moonlight, pilfer. Uh, there's nepotism, interest group influence, unionism, strikes, you name it. And it's there. So I'm, I'm trying to draw a picture of the system in which this investment is occurring here. Now, um, I, I, I'm an economist, and uh, if I wear my eco economics hat, I would say that, well, it's all because of ex externalities. There are monopolies and cartels. The property rights fail because the government is not very effective. The courts don't do their job and stop there. But 
well, that doesn't give me a handle on the problem. That doesn't give me any lever, any leverage to make a change. Uh, and because of that, I have to get into more organizational and political agendas to understand their structure. And that, that's, that's what I do. Uh, now, I, I try to uh, step back and take a forest view of the political economies that we are dealing with. And uh, uh, I came out with this uh, state space picture. Uh, along the x-axis is economic legitimacy. This is the, let's say, the fraction of the companies who are and the markets who are in the legit domain, and they are producing legitimate goods and services and following the rules. So the more you go towards high, towards the right, the more legitimate is the economy. Uh, so uh, th this is an interesting departure from economics, econo aggregate economic models already, in which the assumption is that all firms are operating as rational actors and all resources are optimally employed, and that's not true. So this axis gives a picture of what type of production organization exists out there. And the y-axis represents the freedoms. Freedoms is, again, uh, two types of freedoms. A, uh, a freedom to participate in the market, so the the government, the governance rules, become facilitators in creating those freedoms. Uh, the freedoms can also be usurped by the insurgent bandit groups. So even though the government rules might exist, those um, extra government forces can limit freedoms of people. And the combination of these two indicators, uh, I try to think, would create a multiplicity of scenarios. Uh, on the lower left-hand corner is a failed state scenario. And the upper right-hand corner is uh, really a, a democratic people power scenario. Uh, mind you, I described three types of organizations, the political economy, the markets, and the firms. And these scenario can exist at all levels. And of course, there is authoritarian rule and, and bandit rule. These are other scenarios now. The, the issue is that, well, if I go back to that, that slide, where a political economy or a market is located, that's one question. And uh, uh, the second question is, uh, how does it arrive there? And if you want to change, what is the path of change? Now, the first question is, to some degree, uh, answered by Isamoglu and Robinson. I think many of you might have seen their voluminous work, Why Nations Fail. Uh, I, um, I'm, I benefited a great, uh, greatly from reading it. But I would like personally to focus not on, how, on the failure, but on the success. So perhaps there's an opportunity to learn from the failure and find a recipe for success. Here's an example of a, of a path of change. Uh, a, a particular uh, economy might exist, say, at this point, and uh, uh, you exogenously reduce a change. And I'll, I'll go over it uh, briefly. And here is a path that's taken. And that's the new equilibrium, which is, which is called a homeostasis. And it seems that uh, multiple points of origin might create paths to the same end uh, sometimes. And I'd like to demonstrate that with, with a live model. Any economic interventions and policies, like uh, the Silk Roads itself, might also create changes in that system. And those changes can be benign as well as uh, 
uh, sort of negative here. It can take the system to a worse condition or a better condition. And if you understand what creates a better condition, we can devise an intervention in a better way. Now, uh, my inspiration comes, as I said, from another Chinese uh, uh, parable, and that's called dynastic cycle. Uh, the dynasties in China rose and fell, uh, and uh, people have tried to understand the structure of the political economies in those dynasties. And uh, in that structure, there are three types of institutions that are the main actors. So I'm, I'm drawing, these are not my creation, I'm drawing, drawing from the dynastic cycle um, uh, parable here. So these are farmers, bandits, and soldiers. Farmers are inclusive, legitimate producers. And I'm using the term inclusive as Esamoglu and Robinson have used it. That is that they produce something that benefits all. Soldiers, of course, uh, create governance and enforce the rules. And bandits uh, loot the farmers, as well as produce their goods and services which are, inclusive, which are exclusive. They're exclusively for these people. They're not available to everybody. And uh, <clears throat> here is a, a map, a system map, a simplified model which perhaps we can use to understand the problem. It's a, it's a mental model. So if I'm a farmer, uh, my decision to remain farmer would depend on, first of all, economic factors, the amount of return I can get as a farmer, if it's more than what I can get as a bandit. And of course, there's a risk element in being a bandit too. And of course, there, is, there are the governance factors that uh, deter me from being a bandit. All things considered, I can make a choice of being a farmer or being a bandit. So the, the composition, uh, in fact, creates the, the conditions which create a decision for me to select my role. And uh, um, any interventions, any economic interventions or governance interventions change those conditions. So in fact, keeping this political economy, uh, even at a metaphorical level, is very useful. Now, again, I'm, I'm referring to Esamoglu and Robinson they define four kinds of institutions. There are inclusive uh, economic institutions and exclusive economic institutions. There are inclusive governance institutions and exclusive governance institutions. And in this simplified map, both exclusive governance institutions and exclusive economic institutions are aggregated into bandits, basically. Okay. Now, there is, of course, a computer model, which is more complex. So um, I'm not going to take you over it, but I'm going to take you to a live model. The model I shared with you is here. So we are, we are not looking at it. We are looking at another layer that allows us to experiment with this model. And uh, here are these various policy levers, which uh, uh, can be moved. And these, these are. Uh, the matrix which arise from understanding the impact of the policies. Now, let me ask you, what would be the impact of investing in infrastructure like transportation in Pakistan? I would say that there are two things happening. One is that uh, there is investment out there which is increasing the economic resources. Is, is that a reasonable assumption? The second is that infrastructure allows people to uh, trade goods and services easily, creates multiplier effects, so it might be increasing the productivity a little bit. 
That's, is that a reasonable assumption? So if I um, make these two assumptions here, and I have here uh, a lever which is, say, increase farmer productivity. And let's just move that lever. And I notice that, in fact, we started here and implemented a policy of increasing productivity, and the system moves, comes to a new homeostasis uh, in this quadrant, which is really a healthy quadrant. So that's not such a bad outcome. Uh, if I increase the resources, because, well, it also increases economic resources, and I move this lever and simulate again, and I notice that the impact is even larger. So, in fact, I'm, I don't feel very dismal about the investment in infrastructure from these experiments. And again, uh, I might not have too much time to explain why this happens. This is very important. But uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you two articles in which it's discussed in detail. Uh, one appeared in Journal of Operations Research. It's more uh, uh, of a math math mathematical uh, format. The other appeared in System Dynamics Review, uh, which is more related to policy. And I'll be happy to send these out. Now, while we are still there, uh, there are some other levers which are quite interesting. Uh, one, one of these is just a switch, which uh, uh, really connects the governance to uh, uh, restriction of loot by the bandits, and basically means using governance for uh, controlling corruption instead of uh, uh, using governance for uh, uh, protecting the VIPs, as I've seen, seen happening in Pakistan and many other countries, uh, by some estimates, about 40 to 60 percent of the police force is used just to protect the VIPs um, and not protect the public. So if uh, I redeploy the use of uh, the governance, say the police force, by flipping this, this lever here, uh, I, I notice that it further helps moving to a healthy quadrant a little bit. Uh, there are other, other things, um, like if I uh, provide external assistance for law and order, uh, and then simulate, and interestingly, this helps too. So uh, just building infrastructure might help a little bit, but there are some hygienes which might help further. And uh, then there are levers which can allow you to test policies like providing military assistance or uh, uh, assisting some insurgents groups, and we can evaluate the impact of such interventions also. So my conclusion is that economic interventions into, into these strange, complex e political economies may create unexpected results. Uh, these are, in, in the literature, these such states are sometimes called arbitrary states. I, uh, I'm not sure if I want to use that term, but for lack of any other term, that's what I have identified them as. But a combination of interventions can be identified for creating successful outcomes. And um, I've been working on other parables. I've, I'm fascinated by what sort of policy paradigms exist based on what's visible and how they ignore the invisible part. And so I've identified about a dozen or so policy paradigms, but this represents work in progress and I hope I'll be able to uh, have it out sometime. A, a very pre preliminary uh, working paper is out, and I'll be happy to send that out if someone wants that. Finally, here's a quiz after my talk. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, here's a picture of the Islamabad metro bus system. It's a, it's a beautiful bus system which has newly been created. Some people call it a white elephant. Others think it's a silk road. Uh, make up your mind. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This is a um, very uh, rich system and uh, uh, presentations are excellent. I also saw we have uh, many uh, uh, experts in the room as well, so I'll just uh, open up uh, for discussions, and I have uh, many uh, questions to ask myself, but I will give you guys um, the, the priorities. And please uh, identify yourself. I think the, this Silk Road process is a lot bigger than just a financial shift, that it really is a paradigm shift for mankind. And I just wanted to present uh, this report, which we published, which was just recently translated into Arabic and presented uh, by the Egyptian Transportation Ministry and also translated recently into Chinese, which is now being circulated throughout China. Um, the point I wanted to make and the question I have is that, look, the United States is collapsing. The transatlantic system is collapsing. Our financial system is bankrupt. The United States people are dying. You have a 3% increase in deaths among Americans just in the last eight years. And I think it's of utmost necessity that the United States be part of this new Silk Road process, not as a financial or business model, but as a necessity for mankind to move forward. And one other point I'll make on this, and I'd like to see your thoughts, is this, the space program. The fact that China is actually moving with a comprehensive space program. They intend to land on the far side of the moon by 2020. This is revolution. The United States hasn't <laughs> gone into, you know, we, we've shut down our manned space program. So I think there's a necessity here to really fight for a systematic change in the United States. It means dumping Wall Street. We can't have a functioning economic system as long as we're bailing out Wall Street with helicopter money. So I wanted to see what the speakers thought. It's how can we get this shift in the United States to be part of this new paradigm? Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a very good question. First of all, I, I'd like to say that the United States is a market economy. Most of the investment here is done by, by people, by entrepreneurs. And uh, the infrastructure investment is, um, is state-led investment. There are heavy sunk costs, so it's sometimes not difficult for private entrepreneurs to um, uh, engage in infrastructure investment, al although things are changing. We have some really, really very rich entrepreneurs who can do the in infrastructure investment. So I, I think your, your idea is in the right place, uh, but it's not something that uh, you come out in the streets for and it happens. Uh, I, I want to find the mechanism for it. Uh, I think the, the current state is created by a very long-term obsolescence cycle. The infrastructure, the industry, the technology with which we have been producing is now a cash cow, it's, it's absolute, obsolete, it has to change. But when a change occurs, it's traumatic, there is unemployment created, and uh, people suffer. And the government, in fact, to avoid that, that suffering, has to create some cushions, and all these bailouts was past part of that cushions. I, I personally believe that if the bailouts did not happen, these institutions will be replaced by more modern, better institutions. But then, for public, it will be a traumatic transition. So it's, it's, there's no simple answer. I cannot advocate either thing. I must evaluate the amount of suffering and the amount of benefit, and then decide if I, if I am a decision maker. Yeah, you go. Um, would you mind circulating that report? Is, is it going around the room? Okay, great. And you can just make sure it ends up in the back. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, 
there are a couple of things that we need to look at. We need to be clear on what actually constitutes progress. Um, if the institute, if the if the form of China's investment in Latin America are um, as well as Africa or any particular model, what we're seeing is actually the um, intensification of a carbon intensive development path. That's um, a, that raises some pretty serious concerns um, for environmental sustainability. Um, I do want to put that alongside the fact that um, China is also a global leader in uh, producing renewable energy technologies. So um, with all of these things, I think I would echo Professor Saeed's um, sentiment that it's important to measure the actual concrete, tangible impacts on the ground. And then, as you say, to work together to identify the worst, uh, the best pathways forward. Do we have a, a question? Uh, are there any other questions? Hello. Uh, I'm the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm the. Yeah. I'm the visiting scholar uh, of uh, Party School. I'm from China. Uh, I have a, a question uh, for the uh, Professor Julia. Uh, can you? Yeah. So uh, you you have mentioned. Uh, thanks for your wonderful presentation. You have mentioned the distribution effect of the China's in outbound investment in the Latin America. I'm so, sorry, can you uh, speak up? Yeah, yeah, you have mentioned the income distribution effect in uh, uh, Latin America and uh, in your uh, presentation. So uh, my, my question is, I think it's every international economic transaction has, has such kind of effects, uh, not only investment, but also trade. And uh, China also, you know, uh, every year we inject uh, uh, absorbed, uh, uh, I think it's more than 100 billion uh, FDI. Uh, and uh, also we have such kind of effects. But overall, China, uh, you know, uh, the FDI in China is a very important driving, driving force in China's economic development. And the, my question is, uh, uh, you know, China also has uh, uh, the investment, outbound investment in the uh, uh, energy and infrastructure projects, uh, not only in Latin America, but also in some advanced countries, uh, such as uh, Australia and Canada. Uh, so, but, but why they have different effects? You know, they also have some uh, effects uh, or some, you know, adverse effects, uh, in, including the environmental effects. But why there's some difference of the outcome of the, the, the investment? I mean, in the uh, Australia and Canada and in the Latin America. And uh, do you have any recommendations how to address this? Address this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Xi for uh, wonderful and uh, long questions. I think I'll just give uh, Professor Klinger a minute to to uh, think about the answers. But we do have our uh, um, distinguished uh, speaker uh, who uh, was uh, so uh, slowed by the American Airlines so, and the weather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we really appreciate your coming. So let's give her applause, and then she will speak. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Min for inviting me here. And I am sorry about the delay. I sat on a plane for more than two hours in National Airport. It was not due to the weather, actually. It was a mechanical problem with the plane. Once they got us on, uh, they wouldn't let us off. So, <laughs> And they kept saying, yes, it's going to be going, it's going to be going. Anyway, uh, I'm sure that you've already had a good overview, although I don't know what the other people talked about. So I'm going to go very quickly through the overview part of my presentation and uh, problems with the data, because I hope, just nod, that's already been covered, like problems with FDI data. You, you don't need anything more on that. So I was going to talk about China's restructuring. And since the uh, 
point of this whole symposium is about how is China's outward uh, FDI going to affect other countries. I want to talk about a very specific area in Africa, which is how might China's restructuring and its overseas FDI affect manufacturing prospects in Africa? Because this is one of the real challenges for Africa, is to move up the value chain and to start, really, for most countries, on a process of structural transformation that is way behind other parts of the world that we are hearing, that no doubt you've heard about here. So uh, China's own restructuring, as you can see, as you know, has been going on. I won't um, belabor this, but um, you can see in this particular uh, graph here, this is a slowdown in the rate of growth of trade. And so the trade, only in 2009 did it dip into really negative territory. But what this shows is that China's demand from the early part of uh, 10 years ago, the early part of, of this past 10-year period, was growing at 40 percent a year. Uh, for trade, for both exports to Africa and imports from Africa. But this has been slowing a lot. And yet there still are opportunities. And I'll go through this, um, the FDI picture that, uh, just to say that we don't have a really good idea of what's happening in Africa because the MOFCOM data is not very good. And other people have tried to put data together, but this is a huge variation. So the De Financial Times says it plunged 84 percent. Deloitte said it's up 360 percent. MOFCOM says down by 45 percent, and so on. So it's really difficult uh, to do this. Even Derek Scissors, who looks at the China Investment Tracker, when I look at his tracking of projects in Africa, I also have a lot of qualms about this. For example, look at 2013 when he said there were $21 billion worth of, of FDI projects signed in Africa, um, and this is just FDI, not other kinds of, of projects, as opposed to MOFCOM, which said $3.37 billion. So this is a huge variation. And a lot of those signed projects will never happen. And so, okay, we're just going to go quickly through this. So the focus is, will be on manufacturing. And as we know from the Chinese uh, data, at least, a significant amount of investment in Africa is in manufacturing, about 15 percent. Now, I haven't been able to determine yet, maybe somebody knows this, but I believe that refinery investments should count as manufacturing. I'm not sure if they do. They might still be undermining, which is the largest sector here. Um, and there are just, I believe, two refinery, large refinery, oil refinery investments, and the rest of the investments are in more traditional kinds of manufacturing. And so according to MOFCOM's figures, the stock of manufacturing in 2012 was $3.4 billion in Africa. And so what we're trying to do in a project that we have at Johns Hopkins at the School of Advanced International Studies at the China Africa Research Initiative, generously funded by DFID, is to try to find out what is actually happening in Chinese manufacturing investment, how much is actually going on as opposed to what we can see in, in these databases. And what kinds of skill transfer and technology transfer are happening? What kinds of spin-offs and diffusion have there been, if any? And so what we did was we first got the MOFCOM investment data on a project-by-project -project basis. And from that, we were able to determine that these were the countries that by the end of 2014 had the largest number of approved investments in something where the investors said they wanted to go into manufacturing. Now, what we're finding is that there's a huge uh, gap between what the investor says they're going to do and when MOFCOM signs off and approves this investment and what they actually do when they get into country. Because a lot of investors say they want to go into manufacturing in order to get incentives of various kinds and in order to get in uh, the door in the host country because host countries welcome manufacturing investment. They're not so welcoming to people who just want to do trading and who want to bring in Chinese um, colleagues to do that. If you're a manufacturing investor, you can usually bring in five, maybe more uh, personnel with you. And so that's a favored um, thing to say you want to do manufacturing. So what we're finding, for example, in Nigeria, out of 128 projects that were um, said to be manufacturing on the MOFCOM data, we were able to only find about a third of those. Uh, and some of those hadn't even started yet, but there were only about a third when we went to Nigeria. So the second part of the research is actually going to the countries and trying to track these manufacturing investments down. And that's hard to do. MOFCOM doesn't have addresses for them or phone numbers. Uh, sometimes they don't have locations where they are in that country. So you have to partner with the investment promotion offices in those countries to get lists from them. And then you have to try to match up from those lists and then do snowball 
uh, interviewing to try to track down as many as we can. And so we're in the first stage of this in Nigeria, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. Um, and I can tell you more about that if you want. But we have right now just a general scoping um, study of what the, the investors are doing. Some of you will be familiar with this flying geese model, which comes from Japanese, um, it comes from Konami Akamatsu, his uh, analysis of how Japan moved out into Southeast Asia as a goose leading other geese uh, in different kinds of sectors, so that in the textile sector, the first ones to go abroad will be those that just do garment assembly, and then later on those that weave the textile machines, and later on those that actually put sewing machines together or manufacture those, those will all move out progressively as labor costs rise. So what are the, what, what is coming to Africa? And I know colleagues like Justin Lin at, at Peking University are really quite optimistic about these flying geese moving to Africa because wages there are quite low compared to, to China and costs are, are also low compared to China these days, at least Eastern China. Well, we aren't finding very many of these flying geese, the traditional ones, coming to Africa yet. Instead, we're see, seeing the goose <laughs> seeking raw materials. We're seeing these vertically integrated geese that are, are finding it useful to set up a whole lot of different subsidiaries right in one place. Small geese traveling together, and then strategic geese looking for local markets, not so much for export. And so I'll give you a few pictures of these. The goose seeking raw materials, this is China overseas tannery in Ethiopia. So they have a big manufacturing investment in which they are uh, taking Ethiopia's really high value um, skins and uh, goat and cattle skins, these are goats and sheep skins actually, and they're tanning it. And then they're exporting those tanned, uh, that tanned leather to China without doing any other value added. Originally they said they were going to make gloves, but they haven't done that yet. So basically they're adding value to local raw materials. The vertically integrated goose here is China non-ferrous metals in Zambia, and what they have is a mine, and then they have a number of ancillary operations, including uh, some kinds of copper products, smelters, and so on, to um, process the copper. So that's a vertically integrated goose. Some of the oil uh, operations would fit into that category as well. The geese traveling and settling together, I have a picture of plastic waste here. This comes from Ghana, and what we're finding is that there are Chinese entrepreneurs coming who are not big state-owned enterprises, they're basically single entrepreneurs that come to see what they can do to make money. And one of the things that they're doing in a number of countries is they're actually doing plastic recycling. And so uh, of the, the kinds of plastics that are, that are there, plastic bags that people sell with water in them, plastic water bottles and other kinds of plastic that they're, they're then uh, recycling into, melting and refining into plastic uh, products of various kinds. And if they don't have the technology in Africa to refine that kind of plastic, they're shipping it back to China where this is still a raw material for plastic productions. Um, this is also a, a geese traveling together. It's a different kind. These are larger scale geese, and um, these are coming into Ethiopia, into the shoe sector. So the first one to come in was Huajian, which is a very large, um, a very large company that came in partly based on political connections. They export to America, also a little bit to Europe. Uh, but they came in earlier, and then other Chinese companies, Taiwanese companies, and other companies that are not Chinese or Taiwanese but are producing in China have been moving into Ethiopia. So we can see this. That's another picture from Hua Jian. But, um, well, let me get to that at, at the end. I'll tell you that in a, in a moment. And the fourth is a strategic goose that's seeking local markets. And a lot of this is in the building industries. Uh, because African infrastructure is about, um, they should be spending about $90 billion a year in Africa on building and maintaining infrastructure. And a lot of the basic production is just not there. Also, strategic geese are those doing assembly for local markets, so FAW, Lifan in Ethiopia, Hisense in South Africa again. And they're um, selling into the, the region. And so these geese land in particular places. Some are old aid projects. Manufacturing was a big um, sector for Chinese aid starting in the 1960s. They aren't necessarily going to the best places that the World Bank says are, are places to do manufacturing investment. So these are the doing business rankings where number one is the best place. But the top uh, five locations where Chinese manufacturing investors are going are not ranked that high by the World Bank. So it's Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and so on. 
And that's not that surprising because China is not ranked as a great place to do business by the World Bank. And yet a lot of people have gone to China to do manufacturing investments. So it could be that the bank is not capturing something. And what we think it's partly not capturing is just this, at this size of the local market. And so when we, again, we look at those five places where the manufacturers are going, uh, these are the ranks in terms of, of population size. In, in Africa. So Nigeria, number one, Ethiopia, two, South Africa, four, five, and seven. So these are places with very large local markets. So we think that probably explains a lot of why they're going there. And then where they have contacts to uh, earlier business where they were um, getting raw materials. So for example, leather and cotton, some uh, firms are going into manufacturing in order to provide value added in those raw material chains. And some are going where they have long-term trading relationships, and then they've gone uh, into joint ventures after 10 years or so of, of supplying inputs and, uh, to traders. So, and this is the last point here, which is it's not just Chinese FDI that's coming into Africa from China. It's also other countries that are finding that China is more expensive for manufacturing operations. So we found British firms, German firms, Taiwanese, Italian firms coming into, uh, into Ethiopia, for example, and setting up manufacturing and coming from China. But this doesn't look like Chinese investment because it's from these other countries. Um, but all of it's being done with Chinese technology. And this is a, a British-owned firm in which Chinese trainers are training Ethiopians to produce gloves. So that was my last slide. And uh, I'm, <laughs> again, sorry for the delay. And this was a, a quick run through. But if you have questions, I'm happy to go into any of this in more detail. Thank you. Well, I am really uh, impressed uh, with the material that uh, we share today. And uh, I, um, uh, I think the Padi Center have put up everything uh, online, um, so you guys can have access to this very uh, 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 first-hand, uh, the, the pioneering materials uh, yourself. Uh, but let's carry on the conversation, uh, particularly the question from Dr. Xi from China, and then we'll uh, launch the second round. Much for your question um, from our visiting scholar at the party school. Um, so the question is basically: China has outbound investment in the energy and infrastructure sector in all over the world. Um, and one thing that I'm attuned to in looking at you know, China Latin America relations is you know, what's going on with respect to North America as well with Canada and the U.S. And uh, the question is. You know, why are there different outcomes in different places? Um, and to keep it very simple, I'll just say that local and domestic governance absolutely matters. Um, you have uh, a variety of different responses in recipient countries and recipient, recipient municipalities with respect to uh, incoming investment from China. Uh, it really ranges, um, as I'm sure you're aware, from um, you know, sort of open arms uh, where areas are desperate for investment and really welcome um, anything that's coming from China. And then you also have, um, in the case of different parts of Brazil, for example, you have a very xenophobic response uh, where the problem is, you know, what might be uh, discussed as, you know, foreign acquisitions of land in general is actually directed against Chinese acquisitions of land in Brazil. Um, but then you also have cases, you know, for example, with the uh, um, Shogong mine in, in Peru, where you had a situation where a local, uh, where a local population really disciplined um, a Chinese firm. But uh, other firms and other actors took notice. And so as a result of the, act of the events in Peru, you had um, a noticeable and increasing sophistication on the part of Chinese actors, you know, every, doing everything from engaging with local PR firms to employing local consultants, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the short answer to that is simply that local context and governance matters. Not just the state, but also um, local stakeholders, uh, workers, and local population too. Okay. Uh, so this gentleman, Grant, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Wait for the mic. Right. This is a, uh, a question uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Klinger and uh, uh, Dr. Brodigam. 
Uh, and it's uh, really, if you, if you would uh, talk back and forth for a little bit about, uh, about uh, Latin America and Africa, I'm trying to uh, understand a little bit about uh, scope and scale of uh, differences uh, or similarities between Chinese involvements in the two continents. And uh, I know uh, Howard French has uh, written his anecdotal uh, book and uh, posits a million or more. And I think that you uh, in Africa, whatever that number means. And I, I, I thought your, your geese was pretty interesting today <laughs> uh, to think about all the cases that he writes about and that you do as well, uh, you know, trying to figure out you know, some uh, definitional from, from the large state-owned companies to the single entrepreneurs. But uh, anyway, just uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the variation that you've talked about and also the scope and scale, if you could make a comment on that each. I'll defer to you. <laughs> uh, without having heard the Latin America one, and I, I know a little bit about what China does in Latin America, I always try to really um, use words precisely when I'm talking about Chinese economic engagement. So for example, I don't use investment when I'm talking about Chinese companies having contracts to build things or Chinese banks financing things. Um, even though investment is a loose term, I usually pretty much use it for FDI. So in Africa, there is very little Chinese FDI in things like infrastructure, but there's a lot of Chinese finance for that and a lot of Chinese uh, work. And we, there was just something that came out, um, I think I just got a tweet on it from Deloitte or something this morning about the amount of, um, of construction work that Chinese companies do in Africa. So it's something like they said 14 or 15 percent of all the projects they see are done by Chinese. So in Africa, this is a, a hugely underappreciated area of Chinese business interest. It's building things in Africa for African governments, for other Chinese companies, uh, for private people, for anyone. Um, and so that's a, a big area of economic activity. However, it's not investment. So when you're looking at investment, um, you're looking at a case where the, the largest investors are the SOEs, um, but the largest number of investors are private. So the biggest projects are SOEs, that, the, but there are many, many more private projects. And they're very hard to get a handle on unless you're actually doing field work, because nobody's tracking this. They don't get MOFCOM approval. Um, my sense is in terms of of the number of Chinese in Africa that neither Howard nor anyone really has a clue. Um, but I think the numbers, uh, there tends to be this thing, there's a million Chinese in Africa, and Howard said that many people have been saying that. But to put that into context, in Japan, the official figures from the immigration authorities are over between 600 and 700,000 Chinese are in Japan. That's one country. So um, there's no place in Africa, with maybe the exception of South Africa, that's anywhere near that, that number of, of Chinese. So we're talking about in 54 countries, um, you're finding there's a lot more now than there used to be. But there's, there's nowhere near this, uh, this idea that, that Africa is being taken over by Chinese migrants. Um, so we've got what the Chinese are doing there in the, the infrastructure sector. It's a bigger sector than mining. It's a bigger sector than uh, certainly agriculture. I just published a book on that where there's almost no agricultural investment. It's a bigger sector than manufacturing. Um, it's, but it's not FDI. It's just a, a big sector of, of economic profit, profitable economic activity is, is building things. And I think in, in Latin America, there's... Um, it's, it's just a different picture, because the Chinese have been building things in Africa since about 1961. And they've been doing it on a profitable basis for others since the end of 1978. This is one of the first places to do uh, outward economic uh, profit-driven activity after the transitions and reforms in China at the end of, the 19, of 1978 was, was Africa, where Chinese firms are already there and they started winning contracts. So let me stop there. And now I'm obviously wanting to take over since I had so little time earlier. But <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, so when I was um, when I was talking about uh, China's investment in Latin America, I wasn't being as precise as um, Dr. Brodingham. I was speaking primarily about uh, loans and um, investment in infrastructure coming from China's policy banks. Uh, that's an entirely different picture from what's happening with uh, firms, state-owned enterprises, um, private companies, etc. Um, but there are some interesting um, differences, and particularly when, when we think about the historical linkages uh, between China and Latin America and Caribbean on one hand and China and Africa on the other. Um, and one of them is you know, these, these long-term histories of labor migration 
um, between China's eastern seaboard and Central America and the Caribbean, um, going back to the late 1800s, but then also accelerating um, after the 1970s and the 1980s, where you had um, various labor disputes um, in free trade zones in Caribbean countries being resolved by bringing in um, workers from China's eastern seaboard and Taiwan. And that's a, a really different sort of dynamic um, of uh, historical patterns of migration that is distinct to um, to Latin America and Caribbean that you might really see elsewhere in Southeast Asia um, or in South Asian states in some cases. Um, but also, um, I think another interesting, interesting aspect to look at is that um, you have, on one hand, you have you know, China and Latin America, China and Africa. But then in Africa, you have certain Latin American countries um, either partnering with or competing with um, so entities from China, particularly in the agricultural sector. So you have, um, in places like Angola and Mozambique, you have, um, you have Brazilian firms engaging in large-scale agribusiness projects. You also have Chinese firms engaging in large-scale agribusiness um, projects. And that's quite different from what's going on in Latin America, where it's much more of a North-South, North America to South America, um, Europe to South America, or China to South America dynamic. You don't necessarily have um, actors or enterprises from African countries um, engaging in large-scale agribusiness schemes in South America. So that's, I suppose that's just a potpourri of the differences. Can I just uh, follow up on that with uh, one quick thing, or two quick things? One is that um, you might be, you probably don't know this, but Mauritius is actually very uh, similar to what you're describing for the Caribbean. In many mm -hmm. ways, it's like a Caribbean country, but lots of imports of Chinese labor um, into the textile industry in Mauritius for quite a long time. That's been happening since the, the 80s, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and then also there is a Chinese diaspora in southern Africa, which is dates back a hundred years, but has also been uh, a Taiwanese and a Hong Kong Chinese in South Africa, even Mauritius very definitely, and then also in Madagascar, even in Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Um, and then uh, about the land investments. In Mozambique, there really hasn't been very much Brazilian investment. There's been a lot of discussion about it, but very little has actually gone forward. And there's not been very much. There has there's one big Chinese project which will be twenty thousand hectares at some some day, <laughs> but it isn't yet. Um, and then in Angola, I don't know about what's happening with Brazil there, but the Chinese um, projects, agricultural projects there, are not FDI. They are Angolan government projects that the Chinese are building for them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the Brazilian firms are doing in Angola, though. Well, um, I actually, I, I want to add my, my points here. Uh, that is, I first know about Professor Berdigan's uh, work is uh, her research on the Taiwanese in Mauritius. Uh, and that was uh, uh, very impressive. And so I was not surprised that, that uh, she started the research and pioneered the study on the Chinese involvement in Africa. And I would love to carry on uh, her, her, the conversation with her um, on, on, on this uh, overseas challenge. Chinese. So the uh, immigrants in Africa, and you know, well, how many of them were these PRC immigrants, or how many of them were, were more related to a, a, a cultural sense of Chinese coming from different uh, uh, places during different uh, regions. Um, but I want to add uh, my question to Professor uh, Khalid. Uh, that is, uh, in your model, you appear to suggest that uh, different investments into the region, they all produce or boost a certain positive outcomes. Uh, I, I just wonder, since uh, uh, the, um, uh, me and uh, Professor Klinger and uh, Professor Bodigan all talked about the different types of, of investments, so if you uh, 
you you are to uh, differentiate the investments by uh, resources acquisition and extraction, and uh, then infrastructure investment and then manufacturing, uh, 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 the, the three types. And if you add the services on, uh, what would be uh, uh, any different? Can you find different results in f uh, from the point of view on the impact on the the, the system? That's a very good question. In, in the model that I shared with you, there is a very high level of aggregation. So all investments, all investments are aggregated into one category. Uh, the only way they are differentiated are between them are that you can invest into the uh, economy, you can invest into the governance sector, or you can invest into the bandit sector. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how, but you mm -hmm. can allow them to, mm -hmm. to prosper. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, to address the question that you are asking, yeah. the model has to be developed at a more disaggregate level. Mm -hmm. So some of the categories, investment categories in it, Mm -hmm. have to be disaggregated. Mm -hmm. But it can be done. I've not done it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. OK, uh, well, your turns. Good afternoon. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I have a question for you. I saw recently on uh, program Vice, I don't know if you are familiar with, that uh, are a few Chinese cities completed but completely empty. Uh, they don't have infrastructure. How come that they diverse and they go to Africa, to South America, to Australia, and they do not deal with the local issue? They can employ a lot of people. They can generate a lot of taxes. And I think on the general, people would feel a lot better that would live in more modern conditions because building those cities, they displaced a lot of local people that you know were built with a lot of misery and, you know, <laughs> grief and whatever. So what is the explanation to that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody? Do you want to talk about the case in Angola? I can do it. But okay. you're talking about in China, aren't you? Yeah. Are you referring to the, the ghost towns in China or overseas? The ghost cities in China, like that oh. looks like Paris or uh, Rome or, you know, oh, so yes. th they have a, an occupancy of 3%, 5%, but basically they are missing the infrastructure. So there is no transportation, there are no roads. Mm -hmm. So even though they are only into short distance, for example, to Shanghai, like 75 or 85 kilometers to there, there is no way of getting in and out in order for people to use all these beautiful buildings and mm -hmm. to live there. If I may respond. Uh, again, it's my perception. I, I think that's an, a very interesting outcome of central planning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me leave it there. <laughs> uh, just to also, there, there are some particularly iconic cases. One is in Ordos um, in Inner Mongolia, but there are others outside of these major metropolises on the eastern seaboard. Um, and they become ghost cities or ghost developments for a variety of reasons. Some are simply that the developers go bankrupt um, and can't finish building the infrastructure or connecting the buildings. Um, the other is that uh, the buildings go up before um, you know, the, the sewer and water lines are connected. So you have, um, you have facades, basically. And then the other um, has to do with, with, um, with there being regional resource shortages. So for example, in Ordos in Inner Mongolia, which is, I think, one of the ghost cities that's gotten the most play in the international press, um, you have a real situation of regional water scarcity, where if this if this ghost town were in fact um, occupied near full occupancy, uh, there would be uh, really serious concerns about what would happen in terms of water provision and service provision there. And this is, um, I would I would argue as a counterpoint that it's not necessarily an outcome of centralized planning, but it's actually um, it's an outcome of a real dynamic, fast, booming real estate market where there's a lot of money to be made in throwing up these developments. And um, and in some cases, 
passing the buck and getting out before it becomes clear that it can't be finished. The way, the, the way it's managed, doesn't the central government control all that? And no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. that's a, that's a, uh, uh, your view. <laughs> uh, that's that's a. Uh, but then it's districted. So no, what I meant by, was by that that a permission to build would be uh, a permit to build would be given by the state maybe without very comprehensive attention being paid to all the constraints that Professor Julie mentioned here. So, um, I mean, I, I've seen to some degree this happening in, in Pakistan. Like in Islamabad, there is now a, a water shortage. And uh, many, many years ago, um, uh, there was a plan made to uh, build another aqu aquifer there. Uh, but it was not built, not the, the government did not permit it because they thought, hey, right now the water is adequate, so without looking into the future. So I, I agree it's a more, I mean, my comment was very reductionist, and you know, I, I apologize <laughs> for <funny>. that. <laughs> <laughs> but to some degree, when the government controls all the permits and carries out an inadequate assessment, these things can happen. Uh, 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 I could just add one thing, which is or two things. One is that if you um, Google on the Economist website, China ghost cities or ghost towns, you'll find a lot of stories in which they talk about ghost towns that were thought to be ghost towns and then filled up. So that what happens sometimes is there is a lag so that everything, because central planning isn't so good, it doesn't all come together at the same point. Um, but that in oftentimes these purported ghost towns do end up filling. And there's a, a case in Angola where there was a Chinese built, it was Chinese finance and Chinese built city like this, a satellite city outside of Luanda. And everyone said when it was first finished, it's a, it's a ghost town, there's nobody living there. I mean, it took a while to get the whole infrastructure, it wasn't just water and all of this, which pretty much was there, but it was how to finance, um, like a mortgage system, so that people could buy these apartments and setting that up. And once that was set up, they filled pretty quickly. So if you look on my blog, uh, you can find stories about this. Um, ghost town and how it changed over time from that perception to one in which it was, it's a vibrant city now. Now, so sometimes this can happen in market economies and it's, it's a manifestation of investment bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 1996, 97, uh, Thailand, there was a big construction boom in Thailand. I, I lived in Thailand at that time. And uh, there were ghost towns, like brand new, swanky cities, empty, tall buildings, no occupancy. A lot of the companies went bankrupt uh, because while well, there was this, this growth and speculative building which overbuilt. Yeah. And uh, I think all those places are now populated. But it took a while, like 20 years, to, to get it working. Market, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I so markets can create these problems too. Yeah, I, I think uh, um, uh, myself, I traveled along the Silk Roads, the parts in China from coastal to central, and uh, you do see some infrastructure, very nice places uh, that are less occupied, uh, and the, the market itself didn't catch up with, uh, with, with the construction business and real estate. Uh, I agree with all, all their comments uh, that is uh, uh, the, the overheated the real estate uh, 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 market. So lots of the actors are private actors, and uh, when the real estate bubble boosted, uh, many of the the the, the, the Losers are also private actors. So they, they, it's a, the the state, the the central state, the policy may complicated the the situation because in 2008 there was a, the stimulus plan, and what's the best way to disperse the the stimulus plan? That is the the lending to 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 build and to uh, conduct real estate construction. But now there's also a, a call within China to convert many of these. Um, 
facilities into affordable housing, and they haven't done, uh, but uh, so some economists are advocating this. So if these are converted into com affordable housing, so that if the government just uh, uh, buy back these uh, uh, empty houses and turn them into for social programs, uh, that's a good uh, uh, use as well. Uh, so I, I, I would uh, um, encourage you to look deeper and uh, see more places. Um, okay, so any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, identify yourself, please. Hi, my name is Zi Zhang. I'm a graduate student at the Party School of Global Study. I'm a double master stu uh, gr uh, degree student, one master in global development policy, and a master of international relations. Uh, I have uh, t two comments. First, I want um, I want to talk about the new SIG role. Um, uh, when, when we just saw the picture, there are two start points of the uh, SIG role one in Xi'an in the west, northwest China, and uh, one is the, the is the Fuzhou, Fujian uh, province in the southeast China. What the internal uh, connection, because these two areas is co very, have a very close connection with current uh, Chinese president, because those, the Shanxi province is the hometown of the ch current Chinese president, and the Fujian, Fuzhou province is where the current Chinese president have been the major of a governor for 10 years, since 19, 1988 to 19, uh, 2007. So I have a comment that because his personality, he created this initial. So, for, but this plan may not, for my, my, my un understanding, this plan may not continue on be after his term ended, but, it, but the project, detailed project will continue even another president of China uh, uh, in 2023. So, so when we understand how why China created this project, we must understand that there are many um, personality c combining with con uh, national strategy. Also, I have read a book by the uh, a policymaker called the Michael Peaceberg is uh, the a policymaker in the U.S. Defen <coughs> Department of Defense. He have a write a book called the 100 Year Marathon. It's, I think it's under. I, I think he's had a little un misunderstanding. This 100 years marathon is not compete the U.S. It's a, a domestic way for China to achieve a goal in 2049 when China achieved 100 anniversary of its DRC uh, salary. Salary in maybe three, three, 30 years later. So, my, from my understanding, the new stick role is if it's a uh, international initiative but more importantly I think uh, even for the for the for generally it was China still focusing domestic politics so in order to resolve the 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 the, the, the problem it seems like the, the that ladies just talk the ghost city in order to resolve the in domestic policy um, issues thank you um, so uh, I, I can I, I'll take this, but uh, Deborah, do you have points, um, prof, uh, Professor Khalid? Do you do you want to comment on this, or I, I can take this question? Please. Yeah. So the um, uh, the the image that I showed uh, that's uh, dated and also re uh, mindful of the source Wall Street Journal in 2014. Uh, and most of the um, more uh, present. Uh, uh, maps if you can use that actually both the land based and uh, maritime based uh, would uh, end uh, in Ningbo so Ningbo all the way to the west and Ningbo all the way to the south Ningbo is a city in Zhejiang and uh, as you as a uh, conspiracy theorist uh, can also argue because uh, uh, President Xi was the uh, 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 party boss of Zhejiang province as well um, but but I, I think uh, um, so you are actually asking in the individual roles versus regional and uh, global uh, factors of this new Silk Road. Uh, I, I think um, uh, I, I see how you argue that this might be individual uh, uh, factors uh, play into the so-called uh, initiative or strategy. Um, I, I think uh, um, even it, uh, it, it, we cannot read too much into the uh, uh, his uh, uh, individual uh, preferences because if you look 
look at uh, the Silk Roads, many of the projects, many of the initiatives were in place before the announcements. So it, 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 it's at least more than 10 years um, that the Chinese uh, investors have been uh, doing things along the road. And if you're interested in the policy, the proximate policy causes, uh, if you are here uh, uh, in my presentation, I said that the, 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 the long-term uh, factors were in the background, but the proximate causes of launching these two uh, were reactive to the, the US TPP, and, uh, uh, and that got factored into the president's uh, policy proposal. So you can read my Asian security article and see the proxy uh, uh, driver of the initiative. Uh, but uh, um, I, uh, I think uh, your observation, you're, you're, you're looking at the individual rather than regional and uh, uh, global factors. So we'll move to uh, this uh, question in the back. Thank you. Oh, so uh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. my name is Zhuo, and uh, I'm from China. Right now I'm studying economics in CES. I'm sophomore. So um, today, like, a lot of people in China actually are criticizing the Chinese foreign deep investment because uh, they said, okay, so um, we have so many domestic problems, but the government still insists on like, you know, foreign investment. Like for example, like um, in the 1960s, uh, China has um, had a very large scale of starvation, but uh, the government still insisted on, you know, spend money on a railroad project in Tanzania, in Africa. So like, uh, you know, many people don't like that. <laughs> and uh, they said, like, uh, you know, foreign investment cannot really, has nothing to do with the domestic problem. And the government should, you know, focus more on, more on the people, but not, you know, people in Africa or <laughs> other countries. So do you have any comments on that or? This is uh, wonderful, but I will invite, uh, because we are, our time is up, I will invite uh, Professor uh, Bradigan to address your question and also conclude uh, the conference. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, Ben. I think that this is a case in which um, being s precise about terms can be helpful. Uh, what China's doing overseas comes into a lot of different categories. Investment um, is very good for China. So if China invests profitably overseas in FDI, this will be to produce more copper, produce more oil, produce more food if it's agriculture, um, or to export China's excess capacity. You don't want more um, labor-intensive jobs in China right now because you need to move up the value chain. As someone studying economics, you understand this. So for investment, it's good for China to export its capital overseas. You have a lot of excess capital. You have a lot of excess foreign exchange reserves. Otherwise, you just put them in treasury bonds, where they're going to get probably minus <laughs> returns. China also has foreign aid. But there's very little foreign aid going into places like Africa. Um, yes, this could be controversial. Yes, it could also be used at home. Uh, but China uses foreign aid for diplomacy and to build friendships. And these are good for China on the international stage. So that, like many countries that are, are out there, foreign aid can help lubricate those relationships. And then China also has excess capital that it's using as loans. And so those loans are tied, by and large, to Chinese businesses doing the work. So this also provides jobs and opportunities for Chinese manufacturers to export into those projects that are being financed by loans and excess capacity in the construction sector to work in other countries financed by those loans. So if Chinese leaders want to explain this more clearly, they could, they could distinguish which kinds of Chinese money is going into which of those buckets. And they could show people in China that the foreign aid is really very small compared to all this other business that's being generated by China's foreign reserves that were earned through China's trade surpluses. And that, I think, would help people understand it better. And this would be good PR for the government. But they're not willing to be that transparent yet. Well, with that, uh, the realistic note will conclude. Uh, but I want to thank Wen Hao uh, from the Buxa, and thank you for helping out uh, here. Thanks, guys.